Lexi says goodbye, and we say hello to another U.S. Women's Open. Hello, hello, and welcome to The Big Pickle, our weekly look into the world of women's golf. I'm Grant Boone, alongside Golf Week senior writer Beth Ann Nichols. We'd love it if you would subscribe to the pod. If you haven't already, leave us a rating and a review, especially if it's good. Our guest today is my Golf Channel NBC colleague, noted Swifty Morgan Pressel, who will join us in a bit to discuss the LPGA's Nelly era break down this week's U.S. Women's Open, including the big news of the day. And if we have time at the end of the show, maybe we'll finally tell you why we do call this the big pickle. The B.A., the biggest week of the year, has arrived. The 79th U.S. Women's Open at Lancaster Country Club, about an hour west of Philadelphia. But the shot heard around the women's golf world came Tuesday before we even knew what hit us. Lexi Thompson announced she will retire at the end of this season, battling nagging hand and wrist injuries for the last couple of years, still just 29 years old, but in the public eye since age 12, when she first qualified for her first U.S. Women's Open. Since that time, in many ways, she has been the face of the LPGA Tour. B.A., how surprised were you by her news on Tuesday? You know, I've been hearing some rumblings that this might be her last season on tour, but I had absolutely no idea that any kind of announcement was coming this week or anytime soon. So I uh, was definitely caught off guard by that. But I do think that, you know, when you look at the injuries, as you just mentioned, playing a limited schedule in recent years, and I really never thought that Lexi uh, would, would be out here for a long time. I could see her following um, Lydia Ko type model of, of retiring before the age of 30. So that's exactly what she's doing. And when you really think about the fact that she turned pro at 15, won for the first time on the LPGA at 16 before she was even a member, it's a really long time. You know, it's half her life doing this. And and she sacrificed a lot, uh, you know, to to have a very, a very lucrative and fulfilling career, but but also, you know, one one that was extremely trying and, and a roller coaster. Yeah, and and in some ways, uh, as phenomenal as she was as a player, uh, she talked a lot about the, what she didn't do, the struggles that she had, the, the the ways in which she didn't succeed on the course, and how that impacted her mental health. She she took some time away uh, a few years ago uh, in the middle of a season, uh, j just to just to address her mental health and try to. Try to get her head right. She's taken some social media breaks before, and she wrote uh, a very poignant letter that was a that was turned into a video that she put out, uh, and then had a press conference on Tuesday. Uh, Beth Ann, I mean, you know, you, you think about the highs, the lows, and one of the reasons why she's been so compelling is that she's had more than most of both the highs mm -hmm. and the lows. What do you think, Lexi's legacy? We, we'll, we're going to have time. Again, it's going to be the end of the season before she re retires. I know she wants to make the Solheim Cup team again. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think she's she's waiting to the end of the season. But um, just kind of first blush here, the legacy of Lexi Thompson. What do you think it is? Well, I think a couple things. Um, you know, I definitely think that what Lexi has done for this tour as a face – the face of American golf for a long time. She has been fantastic with sponsors, fantastic with fans. And in that way, you know, in addition to her prodigious talent and being a power player that was so fun to watch, she's the type of player that you turn your head, you know, you say, who is that? You know, that's, that's the kind of player Lexi Thompson is. And let's say, face it, the LPGA has had a number of number one players who aren't that way, that you couldn't right. pick them out on the range and say, she's the number one player or, She's somebody I need to look up. So in, in that regard, you know, she she really did move the needle for the LPGA and, and made a lot of sponsors happy. And so as Stacey Lewis pointed out to me earlier today, she said, you know, Lexi Thompson came on in the scene when we were at the lowest of lows as a tour and, and was so integral to getting to where we are today. And I thought that was a, a really important perspective to have because I think we can also look at Lexi Thompson's career and say, wow, she only won one major. She won 11 times. So she never was number one in the world. You know, I really thought that she was going to 
do more, you know, and, and she had so many close calls and heartbreaks on the, on, on big stages. And so you think about those heartbreaks almost as much, if not more really than, than you do the triumph simply because they were so raw and they were so, you know, unforgettable. And so I, I, I think, heck, one of them changed the rules of golf. When you look at what happened right. at the 2017 A and A inspiration, I mean, it was, it was massive. So, you know, I, I think, you know, we don't want to get lost in, in, in the heartbreak too much because she really has meant a lot to this tour, uh, even if she's not going to go down as, as an LPGA Hall of Fame player. Right. Uh, at least, of course, not on points, um, certainly. But, uh, yeah, it, it's fascinating. She, she joined the tour. She won as Mike Juan, really, now the CEO of the, of the USGA, but then the Yale PGA Commissioner was just coming on board, as you say, uh, things were not at a great point, and Lexi was a big part of that, and maybe a big part of that resurgence, and maybe she'll have one last moment in the sun. Maybe. Who knows? I mean, maybe a Suzanne right. Pedersen walk-off moment like Suzanne had it at Glen Eagles. Mm -hmm. um, I have a hunch Lexi, if healthy, is going to make the, the Solheim Cup team. I think she'll be a pick. She played brilliantly in Spain last year uh, and, and really had a, a fine fall, if you look at it. Uh, mm -hmm. Played mm -hmm very well on the PGA tour in Vegas with the guys. And uh, we thought maybe there was going to be a resurgence there, but the hand and the wrist that just, she can't even swing the way she normally does with the big deep divots. Uh, it's taken its toll. We'll talk more about Lexi uh, with Morgan Pressel a little bit later on in our show, but we're here on the ground in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We'll be all week, but what's the vibe you're getting out there so far of these first couple of days, BA, and what are you most looking forward to this week? I think when you talk to players about this golf course, you know, they, they comment first on, on how big the property feels, how, uh, how undulated it is. And then they, they, they usually go really quickly to the greens and talk about how difficult the greens are. And, and Nelly Corda called it a beast of a course. You know, it's, it's exactly what the USGA wants in terms of testing every aspect of your game and, and using every club in the bag. So in that respect, even though, Lancaster isn't uh, a golf course that a lot of people nationwide are familiar with. You know, I, I think it is it is one that we should know because I do think it it is, as, as many say, a hidden gem and, and one that, um, you know, the town here does an incredible job of rallying around this event. And that's a big reason why it's back here, uh, because you look at the, the U.S. Open a list of, of venues most recent and future and this one kind of sticks out as a why is that there you know and and a big reason is the community support but then you see it and as almost every player has said to me already this week this looks like a u.s open golf course i mean the, the the gentle rise up the 18th i'm telling you mm -hmm. Uh, this is a William Flynn design. He did Shinnecock uh, on Long Island. He did Cherry Hills to the west um, in Denver. It, it is spectacular and hard. So that'll be something for us to watch. Keep in mind, NG Chun, when she won here in 2015, tied the all-time U.S. Women's Open record at the time with 272. Par 70 took a 66 on the final day for NG just uh, the year she turned 20. Um, she wasn't even a member of the LPGA Tour. Since then, she's won two other majors. And uh, we'll see who gets it done this week. Nelly is the prohibitive favorite, like three and a half to one. And the next closest mm -hmm. is Rose Zhang, I think, at 18 to one at the last check. Lots of talk, B.A., about what Nelly can do for the women's game and trying to take it mainstream off of just the LPGA section of the sports page but uh, you know really crossing over she keeps saying that she wants to stay in her bubble and and primarily let her clubs do the talking well if they talk loudly this week what could a nelly corda win here mean for women's golf in terms of of making that impact well i hope it gets people talking not even more, not just in the golf world, but, you know, obviously in mainstream sports. I mean, I, I, I think Scotty Scheffler's terrific and then now controversial, <laughs> crazy, dramatic season um, has overshadowed 
uh, Nelly Corda in a, in, a, in a way for sure this year um, because, you know, I think a, lo a lot of focus has rightly been on, on, on Scotty, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of Tiger and Annika. You know, <laughs> Annika never – Annika could never really break through uh, what Tiger was doing Tiger, and out of Tiger's shadow. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what, what the TV numbers show us because we really didn't see the bump that I thought we were going to get at Chevron being on network television and especially given the fact that the men were in a rain delay at the same time and, and there wasn't that competition going on uh, for, for golf junkies. <laughs> so, um you know, I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that this is without question, the biggest stage every year in the women's game. And if this is the place where the needle finally moves in a significant way, this is going to be it, you know? So, um, the best case scenario for the LPGA is if we see a Rose and a Nelly showdown, because, you know, we've seen Rose really embrace the spotlight and, and, and I really felt like she did move the needle when she won the Mizuho last year. There was a lot of buzz, almost in a way that, quite frankly, I haven't really seen with Nelly yet, even, despite everything that Nelly's been doing. And obviously, Rose was having a run of her own in the amateur game, and, and yeah. winning at Augusta National is a huge bump. So, you know, Rose had a, had a stretch of her own that was historic. So, you know, you combine those two historic women, <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and it could be really something special for the LPGA and that's, that's pie in the sky right now, but at the same time, really, really doable. I think the crowds are going to be a big part of it. Uh, I've, I've always believed that if you flip on the television and you see a massive number of people watching something, mm -hmm. even if you have really very little interest in that event, you're going to at least ask yourself, even if it's subconsciously, what are they do? Why do so many people right. care about that? And and if we Very see so. massive crowds on NBC and Nelly Corda trying to do something that, you know, you could argue this is this is as fine a season as anyone's ever had to start a year, given the depth of field uh, that we have now. It's only the fourth time someone's won six times before June first, and two of those were in the first two or three years of the tour when only twenty or thirty people were playing. They were all most of them were very 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 good players. But, um, you know, a, a, clearly a much deeper field. And, and to that point, Nelly's win at the Chevron made it four majors for Americans in the last six major championships. Only once in the last 25 years have they had that kind of run. That was 2013-14. Mm -hmm. Korea, which dominated the 2010s, winning literally half of the majors during that decade, including NG right here at Lancaster in 2015. Now NG is the only player from Korea who has won a major since 2020. And it just makes me think when we come back to a place like we are here, 2015 doesn't seem that long ago to me. Um, how different in your mind does the women's golf landscape look since the last time we were here? Well, you know, that question what's wrong with the Americans is not being asked at all this week. And, you know, that's, that's a question that, you know, we've been listening to for a really long time. So, you know, that's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a refreshing change. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, this is an American based tour and it's not that we don't celebrate international players and their wins throughout the years, but, but, you know, it's nice for the Americans to have a season, to have a stretch as well. So, uh, you know, I think it was, it was certainly overdue and uh, it's unfortunate that Lilia Vu, you know, has, has suffered a back injury and had to pull out of, out of the Chevron. Of course, Lilia, you know, won two majors last season, won four, four events total and is currently the world number two. So, you know, I, I understand that she's feeling much better. She just didn't feel that she was prepared enough to be able to come play this week, but that we should expect to see her on tour pretty soon. So. That that would be good to get Lilia back in the mix as well, you know. So it's it's a great, it's a great, you know, time for for American golf, and so I think that should be celebrated this week as you know, especially the you know, Women's Open. Speaking of American golf, there is an individual uniquely qualified to answer all of these questions about Lexi Thompson, about Nellie Corda, about Lancaster Country Club, and let's hear from her now. 
Well, our guest today is, dare I say, the most recognizable voice in women's golf, respected <laughs> across the sport, covering all of the biggest amateur events, men's and women's majors, and this summer, her first Olympic Games. You know her as a record-setting player, major champion, a Solheim Cup hero, and unless you're unaware of Google, you also <laughs> know that she uh, just last week turned a young to quite young 36 years old. But more than all of that, she, to me, is my teammate and my good buddy, Morgan Pressel. Hi, pal. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the big pickle. I mean, this is such an honor. It yeah. is. It really yeah. is. And I'm glad you realize what, what an honor it is. <laughs> um, we got a lot to get to, including Lexi, including Lancaster Country Club, where you played so well in 2015. But let's start with what I think are your wheelhouses, watching Nellie Corda play golf and scouring Taylor Swift lyrics. So you can answer <laughs> this better than anyone I know. Which line from your 28 favorite songs from Tortured Poets Department best describes the run that Nelly is on right now? Oh, it's actually from not one of my favorite songs. I know it's not shocking. Well, I mean, we're on a winning streak. You know, that was, that's a layup. That's too easy. But I mean, it's it's pretty, uh, I mean, just truly incredible what Nelly has accomplished this season. And um, to have had a front row seat to watch it, it has been um I, I don't know really cool I, I you kind of have been waiting for this moment of who's going to take that torch with the lpga and kind of be that next dominant figure and to watch nelly do it to watch her it, it, while it hasn't been effortless in some of the wins she's had all sorts of different kinds of victories and uh, inclement weather coming from behind losing big leads it's it's um, come in so many different ways, but the way that she plays the game, she makes it look so effortless. And it's really quite fun to watch. I'm quite envious of it. Um, and, you know, I think what we've really seen um, as the big difference in Nelly is, um, I know we've talked about it a lot, certainly her putting has definitely, she looks so much more confident with the putter, but I also feel that when she has made uh, mistakes, you don't see her kind of skip a beat. She just it has so much confidence in every part of her game. And I think back to a tee shot that she hit, I believe it was on Saturday on uh, maybe the 14th hole at the Chevron Championship. And it was right in the weeds and they had a hard time finding it, finally found it, pitched out. And she went on to make par uh, made about a really clutch 10 footer for par and, and that kind of mental toughness and the ability to not get flustered under that kind of pressure when everybody was watching her trying to win her fifth in a row, trying to win a major championship is hard enough, let alone when it's your, <laughs> your fifth win in a row, which kind of sounds absolutely ridiculous to say. Um, but that kind of mental fortitude um, and strength to recover from those kinds of situations when she does, uh, on occasion, hit a poor shot. Uh, it's been impressive to watch. Real quick follow-up, if I could. You came on to the LPGA Tour in 2006, so you got to witness firsthand Annika's greatness, uh, Lorena Ochoa. We've seen Yanni, Lydia, uh, at times, Jin Young Ko. You played against them. You've watched some of these others. Do you have a sense as to where this run fits in with uh, these other great runs of the modern era? Oh, it it's, has yet to be determined. I mean, it is, you know, certainly in terms of winning in a very short period of time, um, it's up there with, you know, the greatest that we've seen. Um, I think that her effortlessness of the game kind of reminds me of Yanni Sang, the way that when I would play with Yanni, it was like she was just playing a different game and it didn't matter what golf course she went to. And I think we're kind of seeing that with Nelly. Um, but I mean, the sky is the limit right now for Nelly. And it's, it's too early to put her in any of those categories because she could create a category 
uh, potentially all on her own um, should this continue uh, in even some relative fashion to the way it doesn't even have to be, you know, another six in a row, another five in a row, whatever it is. But I mean, if she can just, you know, continue to play her game, continue to stay in her bubble, as she's talked about so much that has obviously worked very well for her. Um, I mean, the sky's the limit. Morgan, we want to talk about your U.S. Women's Open career here in a bit. But first, we have to, I think, get to the news of the day, which is Lexi Thompson announcing that she's retiring at the end of the season. You know, I guess first, just your your reaction to the news. And then how can you sum up what what she has meant to the tour over the last, you know, 15 years? Yeah, um, you know, I think kind of a lot of the golf world is certainly surprised. And um, I don't know if I'd say I'm surprised, but, you know, Lexi has just been such an incredible ambassador for the sport, given so much of herself and her heart and her soul into this game, into the tour. And, you know, I think she talked a little bit about that today. And even in her note, it, it takes a toll on you. And, having recently stepped away from the game myself, um, when you know, you know, uh, you know, it's probably something that she's been thinking about for a while. And, um, you know, you, you just know that it's time to find something else to do. And, and for a multitude of reasons, as she has spoken about, but I mean, in terms of her impact of the tour, I mean, Grant, you say it a lot. There's nobody that signs more autographs than Lexi does. I don't think there's anybody that goes to more pro-am parties than Lexi does, which a lot of people probably don't know. Um, she writes thank you notes to all of her pro-am participants and to the sponsors each and every week. And, uh, you know, those are the little things that people don't see um, that really make a huge impact. And, and not to mention what people do see is the impact that she's had on little girls, the uh, you know, the young girls who come dressed as Lexi. I mean, think about all the girls who've dressed as Lexi Thompson for Halloween. I mean, I, you know, dreaming of potentially one day uh, being on the LPGA tour. And I, I think I think that she is uh, one of the main reasons golf kind of became cool again for young girls. I think that she was a big part of that. Um, you know, young girls seeing a 16-year-old winning on the LPGA tour. Um, you know, golf was not cool when I was growing up to be playing as a as a young girl. It wasn't that um, sport. And I feel like that's really changed a lot. And I think Lexi has had a lot to do with that um, in kind of um, changing the popularity amongst young girls of the game of golf. And um, it's pretty cool to see and to see how that has in her tenure even still has continues to inspire. And I have no doubt she will continue to do that, too. Well, Morgan, she talked about those young girls being her inspiration uh, in her farewell note. And it hit me uh, earlier today as I was listening to her press conference and watching that farewell video, which was quite extraordinary, uh, as she talked about the mental uh, toll that it has taken uh, on her over these years. It hit me that really you're one of the very few people who knows what she has gone through at the age of 12, being thrown into that fishbowl and people watching you grow up. Uh, it's hard enough to grow up, you know, with no one watching, but, but you all had to do it. And uh, we know that she took some time away to address her mental health a few years ago in the middle of the season. And I wonder if you could um, just speak to some of the themes that she hit on. I thought she was kind of raw and candid, not just in the video, but also in her press conference earlier today. Yeah, I think I think that she's been open about it a lot um, throughout her career and certainly having been um, in a similar position. I mean, anybody somewhat in the public eye, you're defined by how the public sees you. And for a lot of us, that's a golf score. And uh, we all um, are really so much more than that. And especially, I think, with social media gives people a platform to just kind of say whatever is on their mind without really thinking of the consequences of there is another there is a human being on the other side of that that is reading this and and it, and it can be hard at times and 
I mean, I've been, I've told you many times, there's a reason why I haven't been on Twitter in years, because it's just, it's not a healthy place for me to be mentally. And I think in light of certainly what's happened in the golf world over the last week with the passing of Grace and Murray, I think everybody's, um, you know, I think it's, it's an important conversation to have and for Lexi to be so open and honest about it and really talk about her own feelings and her own struggles. Um, here you are a player who has been at the, you know, the top of the game for a very, very long time. And even still, um, you know, struggles with all of this and we are all just human at the end of the day. And, um, I, it's certainly, you could get the sense from what Lexi said, how much of a toll that has taken and um, is a big reason for this decision for her. Morgan, there isn't a player in the field this week over the age of 40 or even 40. <laughs> um, you know, do you see, you know, this this trend kind of going of, of, of players more and more players retiring before the age of 30, especially those who start as young, you know, as, as, as Lexi did. And is that a good thing? Um, is it a good thing for the tour? Um, I think it's best, you know, certainly for players to do what is best for them in terms of, you know, their time to step away. Some are forced away from injury and, and, you know, some, make it a choice and others love to play as long as they possibly can. And, you know, it really is just personal preference. I also think it shows a tremendous, um, tremendously strong youth contingent amongst the tour. Um, you know, the players uh, coming out of amateur golf, junior golf, college golf are very, very strong. Um, there are some uh, really strong young players um, that, have kind of shifted that tide a little bit. And, and certainly since my rookie year, let's say international travel is far greater. I mean, think about the summer that these players have this year. Think about the summer that we have this year covering it. I mean, it's traveling back and forth to Europe back. When do you play? How do you, you know, and, and then they go to Asia in the fall, Asia in the spring, it's a lot of travel and that takes a toll um, on you physically and mentally, uh, both, you know, being away from family, being away from home, but also on your body. And, um, so I think those are a lot of the reasons why we're maybe seeing some players not, um, play as long as, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, uh, what we did see, but, uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that, but I would say just the general change in the schedule, um, is a big one. Morgan, this is U.S. Women's Open Week, of course. Uh, I've heard you talk about what this championship means to you. What does it mean, do you think, uh, to the players in the field? And, and does it mean a little bit more to Americans? Uh, or have we reached a point now where, regardless of, of where they come from, and they do come truly from all over, uh, is this the biggest prize for everyone globally, in your opinion? Well, I think it has been for a long time, but I'm also an American. So I don't know, you maybe you'd have to ask a non-American for that. But, um, you know, I, I don't think I'm alone in that, American or not. I think, uh, you know, certainly um, in my era, it's the championship that I certainly practiced 10 footers to win, um, you know, when I was on the putting green. And I, and I don't think I'm alone there. I'd say, um, Maybe a change, if anything, would be the addition of the Olympics, um, which wasn't something that I even had the foresight to think about because that wasn't that wasn't even on the table for me. Um, but now young girls are and boys are dreaming of becoming Olympians through the sport of golf, and you know maybe winning an Olympic medal would be. Uh, up there, certainly in prestige. But to me, it's always been the U.S. Open. It has always been the biggest event of the year. It's where I first got my start in professional golf, playing playing um, against professionals. Um, and it's always been, for me, the biggest event. And it's 
you know, the biggest event in prestige, the biggest event in history and past winners, the biggest event in, in purse and the USJ continuing to kind of push the envelope there. And all of those are really big and important factors that, um, it just has, it just has a huge feel to it. I love the venues, the golf courses. Um, it, it, it feels like it should feel like it's just freaking awesome. And, uh, you know, walking around at Lancaster today, excuse me, Lancaster, um, it, <laughs> I apologize to everybody who I offended by that, but, um, no, I, it's, it's just a fantastic. It was, it's always been played on the most fantastic golf course, the toughest test of golf. Um, and for me, I always loved a tough test of golf. I loved, a, I was loved a grinders course, one that you didn't have to shoot 20 under par to win and 20 under par is not going to win this week. Um, but you know, those are all the things that I really loved. I loved learning a new golf course each and every year where everybody was on the same playing field. And I mean, those are just so many of the different reasons why the U S open has always been. Um, my favorite championship. Morgan, take us back to 2001 and what spurred you on to sign up for that qualifier as as a 12 year old? What was the behind the scenes there? Because you really kick started a movement. My my grandfather um, signed me up for the qualifier, of course. Um, we were going to play a practice round um it was at Bear lakes and we were going to play a practice round and i was like oh you know what are we what are we playing a practice round for i didn't know what it was and he said oh a qualifier for the u.s open and i said like why am i playing in that and he said oh just for some experience which okay you know my handicap was low enough at the time so i could enter the qualifier and i mean lo and behold i won the darn thing it was like what just happened? Um, and I don't think I really knew what it meant. Um, you know, the U.S. Open is also kind of one of my first memories of watching golf on TV, watching Sari Pak and Jenny Chisirapurn, you know, at Black Wolf Run. That was that's one of my very first memories, really, which is only a couple of years before I qualified. So I didn't really, I think, understand kind of the importance or how kind of wild it was that I qualified at that age. And I do remember uh, my mom was talking about whether we should let my school know what I was doing or if I was sick, <laughs> and, you know, cause I was missing school. Cause I was also supposed to miss, that was on a Monday and then I was going to go to school on Tuesday and then miss Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for a, a junior tournament. So we decided to tell them that I was leaving for golf and it was a good thing because it kind of made the news. So um, that was, a, that was a good decision. <laughs> no, that would have, that would have been pretty tough to hide. Oh, oh gosh. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I just remember, I just didn't want to leave the locker room. That was that's one of my memories. I remember there being rain delays um, and things like that. But I remember not wanting to leave the locker room and like the little dining area that was attached to the locker room um, just because I just sat there and all of the players that I've watched on TV were all in the same room. And, you know, some of them said hi to me and that was like really cool. I like wanted to soak up as much of that experience as I could. And, you know, those are kind of some of my greatest memories beyond you know, the golf course and being inside the ropes and playing a championship golf course and, and being at Pine Needles and all of those things. Um, but I, I just remember like being truly the kid in the candy store, not wanting to leave player dining. <laughs> it was just, it was really cool. You probably did not eat any more ice cream than I try to get you to eat every week when we cover a turn <laughs> on the LPGA tour. Um, I think that's why I can't, I ate so much then that I can't eat, you know, I can't eat as much anymore. That's, that's the issue. You know, BA mentioned this, that, that you really kickstarted a movement. We had seen great junior players in other sports, particularly women's tennis in the eighties and nineties. They grow up with the world watching and everything comes out, teenage petulance uh, and, and precociousness. 
you were one of the very first to do that in golf. And since then, in B Park, won a major as a teenager. Lexi did, Lydia Ko, Brooke Henderson, all of them have made their mark. Now here's asterisk tally, 15 years old, youngest in the field, already a USGA champion as of a couple of weeks ago. Gianna Clement, Yana Wilson are also USGA champions as, as pre-college uh, players, teenagers, high school kids. What advice have you and do you give with young players uh, these days uh, about their career decision making? You know, it's interesting um, because these athletes now, these young athletes, especially with NIL and the change that that has made on the landscape of amateur golf, um, they all have teams around them now where, you know, my team was certainly my grandparents and, and my coach, Martin Hall, who was very instrumental in my career. And, um, but, you know, for me, I, my grandfather was certainly my mentor and, and um, the one who really helped me make some of the big decisions. But now these players have, you know, coaches that travel with them and coaches that, and, and trainers. And, and it's just like, it's a different world than it was um, when we were amateurs. And I think that the thing that I've, you know, when I've talked to, I talked to Yana a little bit um, after she made her decision that she wants to turn pro and we just kind of talked through it a little bit and, you know, Gianna, I've always been, you know, anything that you need, you just reach out, um, you know how to find me. And it's, these young players are so incredible. They know how to get the ball in the hole, but it's, it's sometimes the other things that they might not even have figured out yet or realize that they'll need to figure out. Like uh, some of the rookies will say, you know, what do I do about a caddy? How, help me find a caddy. How do I hire a caddy, fire a caddy? Those are kind of things that come with professional golf that, that you wouldn't really learn um, as an amateur unless you really have the opportunity to play in a lot of professional events. But um, those sorts of things, how do you travel? Where do you stay? Um, but, you know, I think just kind of trying to be there for them, whatever they might need. I, I don't know. They, they're all, they need to teach me. I'll take some golf lessons, you know, it's, <laughs> they teach, they can teach me, you know, now I feel like I'm, the, I used to be the IT help for all of the players on tour. Now I feel like I need them to be my IT help. You know, it's like the next generation, it's progressed a bit. <laughs> uh, we've, we've heard, you know, Nellie talk about how important this championship is to her and, and this is the one, you know, that you'll want to win. What have you learned over the course of your career about how to deal with something when you want it more than everything else? How do, how do you how do you play knowing that that it means so much? Um, you know, you still got to go out there and you got to play. And you know, being nervous just means that you care. And you know, these are the events. That's the reason why you practice is so that you can feel these nerves. You can be in this moment. That adrenaline rush is. I kind of at the end of the day where I got, we're all, I guess, just adrenaline junkies um, who really want to feel that, you know, walking up 18, uh, you know, with a chance to win or being in contention on a, on a Sunday on the first tee, um, you know, those are kind of the moments that you really live for as an athlete. And, you know, it's hard when you, you try as hard as you can to not prep any differently but it ends up happening anyway. It is a new golf course, a golf course that most of this field hasn't seen. Um, and, you know, the practice rounds take forever. Um, and all of those sorts of things. So you try your best to prep the same way that you would for any other event at the end of the, but you still know that it is not any other event, and it is a different event and is the one that you want to win the most. And, and, it's where that Nelly catchphrase of stay in my bubble is going to be more prevalent than ever. I, I was extremely impressed with the way she was able to do that at the Chevron championship. Um, you know, and I think her team did work very hard to create and protect that bubble around her so that when she was off the golf course, it was still protected. And when she was on the golf course, it was her own kind of uh, mental doing and certainly her and Jason um, staying 
in that mental bubble, but it's going to take a lot uh, for any of anybody who's going to win this trophy on Sunday to stay in that bubble, to not realize um, how big of an opportunity it is to be the U S women's open champion and um, to treat it as much as you can, like any other tournament at the same time, while you're on these wild greens with, incredible undulation and you know you've now just hit it over the green and you're in the deep rock deeper rock than you've seen all year chipping straight back down a slope and and all of a sudden you remember that you're at the u.s open and you know par is a good score and so it's really just about mentally trying to forget as much as you can but also embrace it i mean like i said this is what players live for embrace these moments and and the best players rise to the occasion in those biggest moments in any sport. You see it. That's that's just what the best players do. Uh, quickly about Lancaster Country Club. You played it in 2015. It's only other time to host any USGA event. You played great. Um, what do you remember about that week? And what uh, were you reminded of as you walked around the golf course earlier this week? And what are you looking forward to? Yeah, the, the, my biggest memory were the crowds was the incredible reception from Lancaster, from the people of this community who came out in droves. I don't think I'd ever played in crowds like that. And, and even even really in Solheim Cup, um, crowds that came out um, to this championship. And again, similar to saying, you know, the athletes live for that that feeling on the 18th tee on Sunday or the first tee on, on uh, Sunday morning in contention or Sunday afternoon, but they live to play in front of crowds like that. Like that was really, really cool. And it was so much fun. Um, I really love this golf course. I think it is uh, just a fabulous design. Old school puts a lot of emphasis on placement of the golf ball, both off the tee and into the green as well as, you know, a U.S. Open, you always need a good short game, especially um, putting, really. And and I think I was even reminded even more of that walking around today. I, I think I had forgotten quite how severe some of these greens are. Um, and especially the back nine. A lot of the players that I talked to today all talked about the back nine um, just being so tough and the greens being just even that much more uh, difficult than the front nine, um, which maybe has a couple more scoring holes. But when you want to call them scoring opportunities, I think it's going to depend on how the USGA sets up the golf course. And and we're not expected to have really any more rain throughout the week. So how firm and fast it will get and how firm and fast they want it to get. I think it can maybe get as firm as, as firmer than they would like. So they might need to control that a little bit if the heat if the heat um, is high because it, the greens are very, very quick, which which you want them to be. I mean, you you want them to be fast. It's a U.S. Open. It should be it should be the toughest test of golf. That's how that's how I grew up thinking about the U.S. Open as the toughest test of golf. And and I think uh, Lancaster Country Club will live up to that uh, to that challenge. Madeline Sagstrom let me putt one from above the hole at 14 today, and it's still going. And that was about four <laughs> hours. Ago. So if that tells you anything. Um, <laughs> especially 14 it's quick uh, morgan before we let you go um I, again i know a lot of people know this but uh really since you became a major champion you started at the morgan pressel foundation uh, in honor really of your mom uh, who passed away 20 plus years ago uh, in the fall of, of 2003 uh, and you've raised more than 12 million dollars in the fight against breast cancer could you give us just a quick update about the foundation and where people can learn more Thank you. Thank you both for being big supporters of us um, over the many years. And, um, you know, I'm very lucky to have incredible support, uh, you know, from St. Andrews and Boca, from uh, Banyan and West Palm, Banyan Golf Club, as well as uh, we have an event at Woodmont in Maryland as well, which maybe a lot of people might not realize, but uh, we're working hard all year round behind the scenes. We're looking at putting a second mammoth van. We already have one mammoth van have had uh, for quite a few years looking at uh, doubling our 
opportunities in the South Florida area to provide mobile mammography to women all over South Florida. And uh, the fight never ends um, until we until we find a cure for breast cancer. The fight um, still will continue, and uh, that's kind of feel that as maybe my purpose. I don't I don't know. That's kind of deep, but <laughs> um, you know something that I feel very strongly about, and uh, you know I'm grateful for the support of an entire community from um, you know the LPGA to my home to uh, to all of you, and you know we just we keep keep working hard and and do as much as we can and try and save lives. Well, you're remarkable. You're incredible. Uh, incredible, maybe would be the best way to say it. I don't know. And I know you can't wait to go back and listen to this again um, <laughs> as much as you love to go back and, 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 and watch yourself. Um, you crushed it. Thank <laughs> you for joining us. Have a great yes, call with the team this week and let's hope for a great finish on Sunday. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, thanks. Happy U.S. Open week. Let's do it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> thanks, Morgan. Well, our thanks to Morgan Pressel. Uh, B.A., you heard what she had to say. Some final thoughts from you as we head into this 79th U.S. Women's Open from Lancaster. Well, you know, I think, you know, as she said, no matter no matter how you try to push it out of your mind and treat this like any other week, when this is the one you want the most, as Nellie Corda has said, you know, at, at the end of the day, it becomes a little impossible to do that <laughs> as best as you try. But what we've seen from Nellie, I think this year is an incredible amount of growth from the neck up. And so, you know, she she does not compound errors. She's great in, in, in a myriad of circumstances. And so, you know, I I expect Nellie to have a great week. I don't know that she's going to win. But I, I expect her to really show up, and I, and I think in a, in a way that, that we probably haven't seen before in this championship. And, um, you know, it was fun to listen to her talk about uh, her experience in 2013, playing for the first time, you know, warming up next to Lydia Ko on the range and playing a practice round with Michelle Wee West and Nyan Choi, two U.S. Women's Open winners. And, and maybe this is her time. Well, the dress she wore at the Met Gala looks a little bit like the logo for the 79th U.S. Women's <laughs> Open. So maybe, maybe that's a good omen for her. Well, again, uh, we're out of time. Uh, so maybe next episode, we'll tell you why we call it the big pickle. But it, it's been great uh, to, to get ready, to try to digest this Lexi news, to get ready for the U.S. Women's Open, to visit with Morgan Pressel. Thank you again for listening. And a reminder, please subscribe to the show if you would. Uh, leave us a review and a rating. And if you subscribe, of course, you'll uh, have those uh, newest episodes uh, downloaded to you uh, whenever they come out. We'll be with you Sunday night for another Pickle Spear as we wrap up this 79th U.S. Women's Open. So our thanks again to Morgan Pressel, for our engineer Chandler, Ho uh, Chandler Hopeful, and for Beth Ann Nichols, I'm Grant Boone. We'll talk to you Sunday night from Lancaster as we reopen the jar for another Big Pickle.